Expo to do a discussion on conspiracy theorizing and why people uh, do not brush the subject, why people think that it's damaging to the liberty movement, uh, and, and why I think that it actually is rather valuable in, in an area of focus that we should be uh, looking into and educating people on. Uh, Jack's not here, of course, so it's a good one here too. Bad. But uh, uh, yeah, so essentially, uh, back in 2002 is when I had my, you know, quote unquote, political awakening. Uh, I came across a documentary by Alex Jones, which you're, many of you are familiar with him, uh, on cable access down in Austin called 9-11 Road to Tyranny. And this was uh, one of the first documentaries out about uh, what happened on 9-11. And uh, it was a real eye-opener. I think I was about 18 at the time. Um, so it was really easy for me to see through the lies of, of what happened that day. Being a young man, uh, I hadn't yet... Uh, Government hadn't, I didn't feel like government had benefited from me, like a, like my father, for example, having debates with him and try to, you know, open his eyes to what happened on 9-11 was rather difficult because he didn't think it was possible for his government to, uh, to carry out such treachery because his government, he believed, even though it's his own accord and because he's a good man and a hard worker is what made him successful in life, he thinks that it's the United States government that provided him the opportunity to be successful, uh, which I think is a is a farce. It, it was him with his own accord. Government doesn't even exist, right? So I was able to uh, <coughs> to see that, to see right through the lines, being a young man and not having uh, experienced uh, that faith and, and being ready and willing and open to new ideas, also being kind of a rebel already. But uh, after I started researching about 9-11, I uh, started doing a little more research about the uh, conspiracy to create a global government, the Council on Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission, the Bilderberg Group, and it was through these conspiracy theories that I got involved politically. I was a Democrat for a while trying to kick Bush out of office because I thought John Kerry would end the wars. <laughs> it uh, ended up being a joke. Then I learned that they were both skull and bones, the, the secret society at Yale, uh, which was another eye-opener that helped me blur the left-right paradigm. Uh, and then I even supported the fact that uh, the Democrats were going to take a majority of both houses and I was excited about Nancy Pelosi, who who's going to be the Speaker of the House because she, she vowed she would end the war. Uh, so whenever they didn't end the war and they actually increased the war in spending, that was a big eye-opener for me. Uh, and then shortly thereafter, I was introduced to Ron Paul through his campaign, introduced to libertarianism, and Murray Rothbard, which brought me to anarchism. But the whole time, uh, this was all rooted in a very deep mistrust of government because I saw what government is capable of uh, through 9-11. And you know, just a quick note, if there's anybody in the audience that doesn't agree with the prospect that our own government had something to do with the events of 9-11, um, there's just a few things that stick out in my mind that show that they likely did. Uh, I think it's very evident that the buildings were brought down by controlled demolition, especially Building 7. It's absolutely obvious on that one from the, uh, the near free fall speed uh, from a building that was lightly damaged it's very improbable that the top of the building would reach the floor at the same time as you dropping a bowling ball off the top of the building when there was such, uh, many of the floors were still structurally intact. So it kind of uh, seems uh, illogical for something like that to happen. There's molten lava beneath all of the buildings burning for months after that. Uh, the simple office fires, even the, the jet fuel, which actually burnt up uh, almost instantly, didn't stay around to, to, to contribute to the the weakening of the structure, uh, that wouldn't have been able to create enough heat to melt the steel or to create molten pools of lava underneath it. And you have all the drills that are going down at the same time, which is circumstantial. I, I like to focus on the physical and imperial evidence. Uh, you have, and what was really great for me was to see the evolution of the 9-11 truth movement and trying to encourage people to question what happened on 9-11 was a lot more difficult back in 2002, right after it happened, than, than it is today. Uh, there's a lot more persecution, although that's not to say that there's not persecution right now. Uh, what other reasons do I think it's obvious? Uh, a lot of the tests, oh, what I was going to say is, uh, so it was great to see uh, a FOIA release that came out like in 06 or 07 that had a lot of videos that really confirmed a lot of the beliefs that people had, with firefighters sitting down and being like, yeah, you know, there was just explosions, boom, 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 and they're all bloodied up. And then there's even a, a video of some of the firefighters saying, 
We need to get out, we need to evacuate, that building's coming down in 10 seconds. This was building seven. How could anybody know that the building was gonna collapse in 10 seconds uh, whenever, and that implies that it was pre-wired for controlled demolition, which means that it was wired before 9-11, which means that uh, Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda likely did not have access to the World Trade Center tower, so somebody else had to wire it up for implosion. And I think that's the biggest empirical uh, thing right there. So. Aside from all that, uh, if, if you are convinced that 9-11 was an inside job, the next question is, well, what do we do about it? Uh, it's fine to do all your research on your own, but I think it's important for people to get out there and educate people about 9-11 truth. And if you're not necessarily going to be a full-time 9-11 truther like I was many years ago, uh, now 9-11 comes up and I use it if it's relevant to my discussions and, and trying to promote further freedom. Uh, I'll talk about 9-11 if, if someone asks me to, to talk about it like today. Uh, but it's not necessarily in my repertoire of everyday discussions. Uh, but I do think that it should not be avoided because I think there's far too many people in the liberty movement. And I've experienced in Free State Project, and not to speak as a generality because it's just a group of individuals, but it seems like it's kind of brushed to the side. It's not very popular. I think that's one of the reasons why Jack wanted me to, to chat about it. Uh, people think that it'll hurt our efforts to educate people because we'll be seen as kooks. Well, I, for one, have, have developed a little... Uh, uh, indicator of the things that we ought to talk about and the actions that we ought to take and it's easy to see the stuff that the government doesn't want you to talk about we should be talking about that stuff and the actions that the state doesn't want us to carry out that's the stuff we should be carrying out uh, so one of the indicators is those things that they they try to mystify and kookify 9-11 is one of them they don't want us talking about that there's a reason so the reason why I think it's valuable to include the prospect of false flag terrorism which is when a government attacks its own interests, blames it on another state or another group of individuals in order to further a predetermined goal, is because they're using that MO of problem, reaction, solution, whereby they create the problem, the reaction in most instances is fear, the solution is more government, more control, and more war. And in the liberty movement, our goal is to create an environment where we can express our inherent individual liberty. Well one of the biggest detriments to fulfilling that uh, desire to be free has been the police state that's developed after as a result of 9-11 and it hasn't slowed down in the least bit from the Patriot Act, the Military Commissions Act, uh, the John Warner Defense Authorization Act, now we have the new NDAA, the Department of Homeland Security, the fusion center systems which are the Big Brother information gathering and intelligence sharing centers, uh, the TSA, all of this came as a result of 9-11 and the foundational premise of why we ought to have these institutions and why you ought to just buck up and take the pat down or the scanner is because we're all, our lives are in, in danger of a, of a threat from Al-Qaeda. So in doing political activism and in pushing back on these institutions, it's very valuable to be able to pull the rug out from the state and to take away their authority by demonstrating that the selling point for all of this tyranny is a lie. And I think that's something that people often avoid. So if we're able to get out there and dispel the fear that's in the minds of so many Americans that allows them to go through the body scanners, and we were really involved with the TSA battle, and I always remember it was very upsetting to see the uh, news reports when they go interview people and some people be like, oh yeah, it's absolutely terrible. I can't believe we're having to go through this, but it keeps us safe, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's really upsetting and unsettling for the American public to be willing to do that because they're scared out of their wits of an Al-Qaeda attack. So I think it's absolutely valuable for whenever we're pushing back on this ever encroaching police state, Department of Homeland Security, uh, we ought to be dispelling the myth that, again, 9-11 was perpetrated by uh, uh, Al-Qaeda, which is a government creation in and of itself. The name means the base, and it's derived from the database that they had of Al-Qaeda fighters that they utilized, uh, uh, the Mujahideen freedom fighters, uh, to help defeat the Soviets. Uh, so yeah, again, I think it's, it's absolutely valuable. It helps. We ought not to avoid it, because unlike in 2002, uh, the American public is actually ready to receive a message like that. And for those not ready and willing to receive that message, that's fine. Uh, I think the ability to wake up people to that, uh, say for example this room right here, so I'm not talking to, you know, it seems to be a crowd of largely uh, libertarians who are open-minded, but I'm just talking to the general public or people that are politically active. 
and I start to broach the topic of false flag terrorism, for me, if I'm willing to get through to one person and to get them to realize the potential that our government is capable of such treachery, even if the other 99 people say, oh, I'm not going to hear this guy out, he thinks that 9-11 was an inside job, and they leave, just getting through to that one person, I think, is more valuable than turning the 99 off, because when you can convince someone that government is capable of something like that, I don't think there's a quicker path to libertarianism. Completely reject and throw out all of their hope and faith and uh, the idea that government is legitimate for them to realize that they're capable of such treachery. Uh, and that's just my particular opinion. Not to mention individuals who are willing, who are willing to not hear you out and to completely ignore the rest of your message because you do believe something and you do question your government, which is an American thing to do. Uh, they might not be worth influencing in the first place. They not, may not be uh, someone who we want to pull into the ranks of the liberty movement uh, because it seems like they're you know, more dedicated to uh, their ideas or to the status quo than they are to challenging those ideas and, and thinking outside the box. Uh, another thing I want to talk about is uh, the marginalization efforts that are taking place through the Department of Homeland Security, through uh, non-governmental organizations like the Southern Poverty Law Center and the Anti-Defamation League. And uh, to illustrate what's happening and why it's important and why it's dangerous for us, uh, I'd like to go back to the Oklahoma City bombing, which uh, is, is plainly clear uh, that was a false flag attack as well, took place uh, was it April 19th, in 1995, and uh, just some of the quick anomalies that took place there. Uh, I had the, the pleasure of, of getting a first-hand tour of the Oklahoma City bombing memorial, and uh, one of the survivors that was in the office that day, his name is uh, VZ Lawton, uh, we had the pleasure of, of him walking around with us and, and, and telling us his story of what happened that day. And he said that he uh, plainly noticed that there were two explosions. One took place behind him and blew the floor out behind him. The other one then took place shortly after in front of the, uh, the Murrah building, and that was the truck bomb. Uh, not to mention all of the media reports, the law enforcement reports, that were mul there were multiple bombs uh, in the building, in the rubble after the initial explosion. It again uh, harkens back to what happened on 9-11. Uh, this, uh, um, what's his face? Who's the guy that got arrested? Okay. Timothy McVeigh. He uh, wouldn't have had the ability to get into this highly secured federal building to rig up the, the place for explosions, uh, unless, of course, he was working with the feds, which it turns out he was. But uh, so again, that, that logically shows that uh, if there were multiple explosions in the building, then it wasn't only the truck bomb, which implies that there must have been some insider operation. Not to mention the ATF who had their offices there, They were none of them were present. There was media reports that they got uh, tipped off to not come into work today. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, inconsistencies and inaccuracies about uh, John Doe number two, Timothy McVeigh wasn't alone. Uh, all sorts of eyewitness testimony to uh, chicanery going on uh, regarding the investigation. There was a massive cover up and uh, unfortunately, we didn't have the internet back in 1995, where I think there would have been an Oklahoma City bombing truth movement, just like there was a 9-11 truth movement. Um, but it was very damaging, and, and what happened, because people weren't there to expose their MO or their tool or tactic of false flag terrorism, is they were able to do it again, which is another important reason why we should be educating people about the tool of false flag terrorism, because if we don't expose it, they're just going to keep on using it over and over and over. Who knows, maybe they'll use it to sell us into a war. Uh, with Iran. Uh, but the point I was making was after the Oklahoma City bombing, so you say who stands to benefit? Obviously, Timothy McVeigh didn't benefit. He's locked up. Uh, obviously, it didn't deter. They say that he did it as a result of the, of the massacre at uh, Ruby Ridge in Waco. Obviously, it didn't slow any of that down. But who did benefit was the federal government who passed the Omnibus uh, Anti Terrorism Act, which is kind of Patriot Act light shortly after exactly how Patriot Act was passed after 9 11. But on top of that, they also launched a very successful marginalization campaign to put the fire out that was uh, burning with the patriot movement and the militia movement. So as often happens when a, uh, a globalist, uh, democratic socialist takes power in the United States, as with Bill Clinton, uh, you'll see the patriot movement uh, begin to grow and flourish. The exact same thing is happening after Obama took office with the Tea Party movement, with the patriot movement. And I define the patriot movement, which is different from the libertarian movement, although it can be in the blanket of the broader freedom movement, uh, as those uh, individuals who adhere strictly to the Constitution and take a strong stance on states' rights 
and Second Amendment. Uh, they're a little more Stuart Rhodes. Uh, but either way, there was a burgeoning patriot movement and militias were beginning to organize all across the country in response to uh, a tyrant who they saw as abusing the Constitution in Bill Clinton. And what happened shortly after the Oklahoma City bombing was the mainstream media outlets uh, and the Southern Poverty Law Center, who was actually at Elohim City, which was a militia compound uh, that uh, Timothy McVeigh was said to have visited. They had, a, you know, the SPLC is like its own private investigation agency. They're not tied down by the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution, so they can pretty much do as they please. They work hand in hand with the FBI. But immediately after that uh, Oklahoma City bombing, they launched a marginalization campaign. So they're getting the American public to believe that there's a, a threat of right-wing extremists in America, of militiamen, and they essentially uh, killed the militia movement and killed the patriot movement, or at least put it back to sleep because uh, the establishment saw it as a threat. So whether the purpose of the Oklahoma City bombing was to pass this anti-terror act or to, put, to, to dispel the threat of the militia and patriot movement, they managed to accomplish both of those things. So now we see the very same thing taking place now. And what happened with 9-11, it was obviously on a grander scale than the Oklahoma City bombing, Maybe in 93 they meant to bring the towers down and they had another false flag attack uh, with the original uh, World Trade Center bombing attack, which was, uh, there's backed up evidence uh, that uh, the guy who was the FBI handler, he didn't know that the bomb was going to be a real bomb. They thought it was a fake bomb like they do uh, you know, in Seattle. Somebody was recently busted, uh, the underwear bomber. Uh, these are all you know, FBI patsies that are uh, essentially given the bomb and the FBI made the bomb. Sometimes they go off like they did in Oklahoma City. Um, but essentially what happened after 9-11 was everybody was so scared that they willingly accepted the creation of an anti-terror apparatus that was sold to us as a means of protecting us from external threats, when in reality what's happened is it's been inverted and now it's being focused back on the exact same patriot movement that's been growing ever since Obama took office. And we see the institutions that they built to protect us from external terror, like the Department of Homeland Security, uh, are now spending most of their time focusing on a domestic terror threat. And they're putting out all sorts of documents. Many, many people are familiar with the MIAC report, the Missouri Information Analysis Center report, which labeled Ron Paul supporters, uh, Constitution Party supporters, Libertarian Party supporters, individuals who have a Don't Tread on Me flag, people who are against the Real ID, people who are against the IRS, people who are against the prospect of the North American Union. Uh, they are encouraging law enforcement to feel as if these people are a violent threat to them. Then you have the Department of Homeland Security report on right-wing extremism, uh, which said that returning veterans should be considered a threat. They defined right-wing extremism as uh, those individuals or groups which are opposed to federal authority and favor local or state authority. <laughs> so pretty much just about everybody here at the conference, except for the anarchists who favor the authority at all. Uh, they're the real threat. Um, so essentially what's taking place now uh, on a two-pronged approach is the Department of Homeland Security through the Fusion Center apparatus and the Department of Justice as well participates. And it's interesting to note that the Eric Holder, uh, the Attorney General right now, head of the Department of Justice, he was uh, played a major role in the cover-up of Oklahoma City bombing. Uh, they are influencing law enforcement to believe that individuals who subscribe to the philosophy of liberty or constitutional government uh, are, are violent threats. Simultaneously, they're getting out in the public through other institutions like the Southern Poverty Law Center, and they're making the public to believe that individuals who subscribe to our mindset uh, are threats as well. And essentially what happens in history, what, pre what precedes a uh, marginalization campaign is some nasty action, whether it was in uh, Nazi Germany, uh, you know, you can't just go around up the Jewish people without first making the German public believe that the Jewish people are a threat to their uh, status quo and to their comfort level. And unfortunately, we see that taking place here in the United States. And the people that are being marginalized are those that are a threat to the status quo, which is big government centralization of power. And I fear with the passage of the NDAA and the further development of uh, detention centers, which is not a conspiracy theory, uh, that they may potentially use those institutions in order to uh, um, gather people up who, who share our mindset. And again, the, the, the purpose of the marginalization is to make it to where if they do do something like that, which is absolutely brash, the American public will be like, oh, well, that's okay. Those people weren't like me. They were evil right-wing extremists who were creating disorder in society. 
So in order to dispel that, I think it's absolutely necessary that we get out and we're vocal and we're public in the community. Uh, we participate in, in, so essentially philanthropy, not only being valuable because you, you better the world, it's also an insurance policy that I encourage libertarians and anarchists and those engaging in civil disobedience and those espousing conspiracy theories uh, to engage in philanthropy, to go work at the local bread line, to go build community gardens in your, in your community. So that way, if you're targeted for some sort of harassment or indefinitely detained, uh, the public will not just say, oh, okay, that's okay, that guy was a weird, wacko, lunatic, right-wing extremist. They'll say, why is the government rounding this guy up? He's a, a peaceful person. I saw him at the bread line the other day. I saw him walking an elderly woman across the street the other day. And uh, what could potentially turn out is the state will lose more face uh, than they're gaining by keeping people safe. So that's, that's taking place. There's marginalization efforts going on right now. It's very dangerous. Another institution that, that is being grown uh, immensely as a result of 9-11 is the creation of the police state. In Keene, of course, you got the Bearcat coming, uh, which is from a Department of Homeland Security grant, and the Department of Homeland Security rose after 9-11. So again, I think we could get people to, to more easily object to the growth of the police state if they understand that the foundation is based on lies. Uh, also, as a result of 9-11, we see the expansion of the uh, militarization and federalization of local law enforcement. And as they're giving the local law enforcement more power, more fancy toys, again, they're also training them that you and I pose a threat to them. And that goes so far. You don't even have to be to have quote unquote right wing extremist views or believe we should return to the Constitution or favor local authority over federal authority. Now they're sending out suspicious activity uh, uh, indicators to a, a slew of different businesses and services and they're saying uh, for the internet cafe for example, I don't know if people heard about this, if you pay in cash you might be a domestic terrorist. <laughs> if you shield your screen from other people you might be a domestic terrorist. <laughs> If you use encrypted passwords and encrypted emails, you might be a domestic terrorist. What else might be a domestic terrorist? If you have a security a perimeter on your home, you might be a domestic terrorist. If you uh, hoard gold, you might be a domestic terrorist. Seven days of food. If you have seven days or more of food, you might be a domestic terrorist. If you shop at military surplus stores, you might be a domestic terrorist. Uh, so essentially, as a result of 9-11, they're now setting up the Snoop and Snitch Society where they create an environment where individuals are afraid to act or speak out or use cash or hoard gold or store food because they're afraid that their neighbors are going to snitch them out. And that's essentially what a thought crime is. People are afraid to engage in it before. It's a preemption. They're deterred from engaging in these acts which are as natural you know, as, as eating dinner or buying your own groceries or paying with cash because they think that their neighbor is going to snitch them out. Uh, I think that it's not working for them. I, I would like to think a large majority of the American public sees through a lot of that, but you still have these little ninnies out there, the uh, goody two-shoe, uh, you know, uh, Johnny Do-Gooder, who's going to get a power trip on calling the Department of Homeland Security because he thinks there's a threat. But again, this all arose out of 9-11, and it's all being furthered because people still live in fear. So I would encourage people not to be afraid to, to broach the topic. Of course, you're going to want to do as much research as possible. But next time someone's debating whether or not we should have body scanners or whether or not we should have NDAA or you're speaking with someone that's in favor of these programs or they think uh, that they're okay, instead of just talking about the morality of scanners or the uh, health effects of scanners, I think it's valuable to go ahead and get back to that fundamental premise on, well, hold on, let's, let's talk about why these scanners are even here. Why is there a supposed need for us to have the scanners? Well, it's because of 9-11. Let's examine that again. Were you aware of A, B, and C? A great line to use is, I don't know if you've looked into the issue, but recently a FOIA request was, was taken out, and there's these new videos that really opened my eyes. So maybe we could revisit this, because this is a new thing that recently came out. So, uh, yeah, I would just encourage libertarians not to, to be afraid of broaching this subject. Uh, I broach it all the time. Uh, two quick stories to illustrate that note, both having to do with Liberty Fest, which is an event that Danny Panzella helped put together. First one was in uh, New York City, uh, I guess it was two years ago, and I was invited as a speaker. At the time, I was executive director of Texans for Accountable Government, a local political action committee in Texas. Uh, we do a lot of stuff against the Department of Homeland Security, against the growing police state, against the TSA. and. Uh, was it the 10-year anniversary or was it the next year the 10-year anniversary? The next year. Okay. 
So I was going up to New York City to speak at an event that was shortly after 9-11, and I informed some of the people on the steering committee of my group that I was likely going to be talking about 9-11 and how it influenced my life as an activist. And the alarm bells go up. Oh, no! You can't talk about 9-11. You're going to make us look bad back in Texas. And a whole big discussion and infighting and arguments went back and forth. A few people that thought it would make us look kooky. Uh, long story short, I ended up talking about 9-11. I actually talked about the fact that I was deterred, attempted to deter me from talking about 9-11. Come home. <laughs> Do they think that the mainstream media is going to be like, oh, John Bush is going to New York City. We better follow what he says so we can discredit him. No, that's not what happened. Nothing ever came, came of it whatsoever. They didn't bring it up. And even if they did bring it up, fine, let them bring it up. It'll bring the question into people's minds. So then what happened two years later, and I'm sure Danny won't mind me hearing the dirty laundry about what took place at the event. Uh, you know, it's a freedom event. Uh, Ron Paul was invited to come participate. A lot of Ron Paul supporters, people that are close with the Ron Paul campaign were speakers at the event. And one of the people that was helping to organize the event, who's way deep into the Ron Paul campaign, and some of these people think that Ron Paul's our only hope and Ron Paul's everything and our ultimate end is to get Ron Paul in office rather than our ultimate end being to create a free society. So they allow their means and ends to get confused. Uh, they started a whisper campaign that this was a truther event. And they called all of the speakers and said, this is a truther event. You don't want to be there. You'll be discredited. So some of the speakers actually dropped out uh, because of this. <coughs> Name names. Uh, uh, either way. Speakers dropped out, and it was because they thought that this was a 9-11 event, and they didn't want to be associated with a 9-11 event. And the only thing that made it a 9-11 event was, I think, probably the fact that the architects and engineers, Richard Gage, spoke. It wasn't like, it wasn't in the title, 9-11 Truth, it was Liberty Fest. So obviously, 9-11 created a mad, dramatic loss of liberty. Why not broach the subject at a Liberty Fest? But some people backed out. There was a lot of infighting that took place, a lot of uh, heated momentum, and all over nothing. All over people that are afraid is what it is. People are afraid of what others will think of them. People are afraid of, of being seen as a kook. But to go back to what I said earlier, those individuals who are not willing to hear you out because you profess 9-11 truth may not be that worthy of influencing anyway. They may be so hard-headed that they're not uh, worth the time and energy to recruit into the growing liberty movement. I want people in the liberty movement that are willing to question anything at all costs, no matter if it damages their reputation. Uh, there's a gentleman named Schaefer Cox who uh, is locked up in jail in Alaska. Uh, he was actually the head of a, a, a large militia up there, and they were building competing institutions like a common law court. Uh, and he said something that had a really profound impact on me at a Continental Congress in 2009. He said, I would rather have uh, 1,000 men that I believe in and trust and that I know where they stand than 10,000 that I question. So when it comes again to broaching the topic of 9-11, if you're going to turn people off, then so be it. Maybe they're not worthy of, of your time or energy anyway. But again, you're talking to a group of 100 if you influence the five to see that government is capable of such treachery, that five will be ripe and prime for going down the path to anarchism, because again, they've, they've seen what it's capable of. And this has happened multiple times through my life. And I've always, uh, I've never shied away from the topic, no matter what people in my organization or group have thought or, you know, given speeches, and it's never come to bite me in the ass. There's never been, I, I get a lot of press in the, in the local area, a lot of mainstream coverage in the papers and the news stories, and none of them ever, have ever said, oh, John Bush, the 9-11 truther, Maybe if I had to run for office, it would come up, but then it'd just be a platform. So aren't you a 9-11 truther? Well, actually, yeah, I've had questions for many years. You guys haven't questioned 9-11 yet? <laughs> so, yeah, I guess that's just the topic of, uh, of, of what I'm trying to, to put out here again to, to drive the message home. As a result of 9-11, massive institutions that have greatly inhibited our individual liberty have developed. If we want to get people more against these institutions, I think it's important that we strike the root and we undermine the foundation and the lies that the state has grown. We need to educate people about the state's use of false flag terrorism. Not only will it uh, allow us to, to ease, more easily convert them to libertarianism, because they've been made aware of what government is capable of, what better way to show that government is forced than to demonstrate they murdered 3,000 of their own citizens. Uh, but not only that, if we do educate more people about false flag terrorism, then we can take it away as a tool that governments use. Because if everyone's aware that they use that, next time they pull one off, people won't be able to buy into their problem reaction solution paradigm. So that's pretty much it. Uh, I think we're 
the, the 30 spot. The last one went over. It seems like things are going over. I, I guess I could take a couple questions. Anybody? Yes. Uh, one of the biggest technical issues that raised questions for me early on, early on, I knew about the September 11th attack beforehand. Um, I didn't know that it was going to be a false flag attack, but I knew that they had an Al-Qaeda group that was looking at the Twin Towers and other targets. But, uh, one of the biggest technical issues that, that, that had me raising questions immediately was the plane that was supposed to have crashed into the ground on Flight 93, mm -hmm. that the wreckage was spread over several miles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, you, know, you, you can tell the people who refused to, to, to think about it and the people who refused to start processing and questioning it when you have a plane that's supposed to have crashed into the ground and uh -huh. you've got pieces of wreckage spread over what, what was it, eight miles or... Yeah, and there's essentially nothing there in the hole. Right. Yeah. It's pretty clear that was probably shot down by a plane, uh, which I think corresponds with uh, Norman Panetta's uh, uh, testimony, uh, who said that he kept on going back into Cheney and telling him that, uh, you know, he heard Cheney say the orders still stand. Uh, which might have been to not shoot it down, but some people postulate that Flight 93 might have been heading towards World Trade Center 7. There's so it wouldn't have been so crazy that World Trade Center 7 collapsed because it might have been hit by a plane too, but that's just a, a... Another fact that came up recently, uh, obviously NORAD being ordered to stand down for the first mm -hmm. time in 60 years, but the biggest one, probably the, the, the biggest one for me was uh, uh, they had three, they had at least two planes land. I think it, one at Cleveland Airport, one at another airport. And all of the passengers were taken off, and this was witnessed by, by people written down in somebody's log, taken off to a NASA hangar, and none of the people taken to the NASA hangar were ever seen again. And then the planes that actually struck the Twin Towers said there's no possible way they could have their black box turn off, and then a different black box with a different signal appear over here, mm -hmm. and the plane would have to travel at Mach 2 or something yeah. to, to make that distance. And then the planes um, actually hitting the Twin, the twin Towers all of the witnesses who saw them said these are not commercial airlines. These sure, are sure. Something completely different. Yeah, it's not that difficult to make the case. There's a multitude of different facts out there, and it's always good and, uh, to be well versed in, in, a, in, in multiple of them. Uh, one more question. It seems that recently there's been a lot of the uh, sort of false flags that don't happen where they'll find somebody who seems to be like a little, uh, like, maybe mentally slow, and they'll uh -huh. get them to bring a fake bomb somewhere and say, oh, he was going to bomb it and cut the yeah. Uh, most people, I'm sure, who are reading those stories, they just see the story about some guy was going to bomb something and he got caught. There's still a threat that exists. So uh, maybe it's like uh, something that we need to do as people who spread liberty media is to expose these stories. But of course, if we were to cover these or interact with those people who are locked up for life for doing these things that's associated with terrorists. Uh, so what do you think could be done to uh, sort of spread the idea that look at all these terrorist attacks that are supposedly about to happen that are really just FBI constructs? Uh, yeah, I think you could start by demonstrating that the 1993 World Trade Center bombing was obviously uh, carried out by the FBI. They made the bomb, and there's a great interview that you can get off the internet of the FBI undercover agent saying that he didn't know it was going to be a real bomb, and he, you could tell that he felt remorse for participating in it. So you can use that to demonstrate their MO, which is easily provable, and say, wow, this is strikingly similar to what took place in Seattle recently with the underwear bomber. And usually there's holes you can find, like uh, Kurt Haskell, for example, with the underwear bomber. He's an attorney who witnessed a, uh, a suited man escort, uh, Abdul Motalib, that was his name, uh, beyond security. Uh, so it, it, you can just find the, the most damning evidence that you can and kind of stick and harp on that. But I think taking it back to, wow, this is just, this is the exact same thing they've been doing since 1993. They did it here. They're capable of doing it again. Uh, I think that would help. And yeah, I do think we should be focusing on those issues because if you notice after the underwear bomber, that's the justification they used to roll out the scanners. And after the shoe bomber, that's the justification they used to take the, the shoes off. So I think a lot of the scanner stuff is they're just pushing it as far as they can to, to get Americans to submit, which I believe will assist in their broader push to take away our liberties. Because if we're pathetic enough to let them put their hands in our pants, and I've had it done to me once, it's absolutely terrible. Uh, then you know we're more likely to let them raid our house or to stand by when they're rounding up our neighbors and stuff like that because they're just slowly and surely beating us down. But yeah, it's always important to, to educate those people. And I would just find that one fact or so that you can uh, that you can really harp on and make sure it's covered up and, and uh, covered well and documented. I think that's valuable. They use different excuses to what steal stuff to. I mean, they 
some cases, they search bags uh -huh. enough times that, you, that it becomes a blow and then some of it isn't there when you get out of security. For sure. One, one of the interesting points, just real quick, uh, they tried to get the body scanners passed to, for Congress to approve the use of body scanners prior to the underwear bombing, mm. and Congress said no. Mm. The underwear bombing happens, all of a sudden there's a $154 million contract. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, real quick. Yeah, I just want to thank you real quick for seeing something I've been seeing for a long time, but obviously you're a more eloquent speaker than I am. I, I've, been, I've been seeing for a lot of years you need to focus as a liberty movement on things like the September 11th attack, and I, I've encountered resistance myself from some sure. party leadership and saying, oh, don't talk about 9-11. Don't talk about how bad the government is. And I'm just like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> and it's just like, this is why we need to be questioning the government. This is why we need to be questioning the government. Mm -hmm. Take a look at this. I mean, for most people, an hour investigating 9/11 is all it takes to, you know, it's better than four years of arguing sure. economics. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's it's a quick road to uh, uh, to libertarianism for sure. And even if it's not, uh, even if we ought not to focus on it as you know a single issue, we shouldn't shy away from it, yeah. and we shouldn't uh, avoid using it as a means to further our arguments, uh, for sure. Yeah. Thanks.